This video is going to be very interesting, as we will be discussing a topic that doesn't get that much attention nowadays. Well, it does, but it's usually only associated with spirit photography. But there seems to be an overwhelming amount of historical photos that are presented as real, yet there's something very wrong with these photos. Here's the question. Were there photo manipulation techniques used during the early days of photography, roughly 1840 to 1920, or are all these old historical photos considered as historical fact? I think once you begin to dive into this question, or the idea that they had Photoshop before the 1900s, you'll begin to open some very strange doors that brings up even more questions. We will cover this lost art form of old photo processing and the history behind it to assist in finding further examples of early historical manipulated photos. I wanted to say thank you to Stuff Beagle, he's doing some great research and I recently watched his amazing chat on this subject on Campbell's Autodidactic channel so shout out to them but it's called Overexposed and it really just blew my mind because I had been seeing this in our research with so many photos. The amount of these manipulated photos are really adding up, so I thought we should make a presentation on this. But yeah, Beegs helped a lot with these photos, so make sure you go check them out and send them some love. With that, let's get started. A photo can be a powerful device. For someone experiencing it for the first time, it can truly be magical. Yet, photos tell a story, and for many, it's how we remember the past. It's our only portal into what life was like and in many cases, it explains the nature of what city life was like in those times. When the technology of the photograph first came out in the early 19th century, people did not know what to think of such a new technology, to the point where they would have been ignorant of any such advanced methods of the art, such as compositing or layering multiple photos in one. This would not have been known to the average person, yet today in the modern day, Old photos are used by historians to have a better understanding of the past. From documenting dates, construction photos, even events in history are documented based on this photographic record. For many, we automatically assume that these photos are trustworthy and that they are an accurate depiction of the past. Some of the most famous historical photos are actually never described as being manipulated. So was this some secret art form? I mean, think about it. For such a new device, which we know would have to have been taken over by these capitalists and the media of its time, this would be a powerful tool for propaganda in the wrong hands. The weird thing is, is that this subject of old world photo manipulation is not really discussed online either. You may find a few articles on it, but it's all in the style of, did you know that they had Photoshop in the 1900s? And then they show you the spirit photography, the very blatant ones, or just the retouched portraits. But wait, if they had Photoshop in the 1900s, or wait, even before that, 1850s? Wait, before that, since the dawn of photography? What if they manipulated a photograph and didn't say anything about it being a photo manipulation. Now my experience is in digital compositing, although I do have experience in photography as well, but my degree is in computer animation and I have a thorough understanding of advanced compositing workflows. Interestingly, one of the things we learned in school in my VFX class was called invisible VFX. What this is, is visual effects that you don't see, meaning it's supposed to just assist the story, but not be noticeable as blatantly edited imagery. They used Forrest Gump as it has many examples of invisible effects such as sky swapping, people in green suits, random stuff just to make the scene more pleasing, all with the intention of creating an illusion for the viewer. But this is not new technology. They have been doing this for a long time. There's actually a lot of VFX in that movie. And so my point is that there's blatant manipulation that you notice like superhero movies and monsters, and then there's really good photo manipulation that you don't notice. We have to understand that because then that means there may be hundreds if not thousands of photos on the historic record that could have been retouched or edited in some way. Now at first you may think, well, that's no big deal. They would just clean up the photo. 
but it was way more than just cleaning up. It's to the point where it would be completely possible to tell whatever story you like. I'm not going to be able to play this video, but go check it out. Vox has a video exposing this, and I don't really think they realize it, but the video is called The Mystery of the Same Sky Postcards. Basically, this guy had an obsession of collecting postcards until he started to notice something very strange, a repeating pattern. Quote, you just see it. So this guy has these postcards grouped and organized and clearly says that they were reusing these same stock skies in all these postcards. Same sky postcards is what you type in on Google to find this. He also mentioned how they would shift it around to try to change it up and make variations even though it's the same sky photo. So why would they do this to hundreds of different cards? To make them look better? To present them in a better light? You know that they put postcards in museums from time to time to show how the city looked back then in the day. People don't really think when buying these old postcards that they have been altered to this degree. Maybe some coloring, but complete masking and sky swapping? What else could they do? Well, in the video it says that it became clear that these skies were not a part of the original photos. Even though they are presented as real and no one ever explained that these were altered photographs. Hence the mystery of the same sky postcards. So why would they do that? He then discovers that all these postcards are printed by one company. So they try to explain it off as, oh, this was just a signature of the company, that they would just leave it there in plain sight, but no one would see it. That's strange that they would do that, and it seems to be an operation. So why was this one company going around and editing all these different postcards from so many different locations? Weirdly, they showed this newspaper article with highlighted text saying that Dexter Press Inc. is one of the largest manufacturers of picture postcards. But interestingly, in the grayed out text it says, quote, photo of a bathing beauty beckoning to you on a Florida beach or a trout fisherman fly casting in a Colorado stream. The odds are Dexter Press has it. So they have a massive collection of photos? In this video, they specifically tell you the process in which they do this. The man who owned Dexter Press had an entire art department for photo manipulation. They just didn't call it that, but that's exactly what they were doing. It's called photo processing, and we'll talk more about it shortly. He would offer to photo correct the problems in the image. So there you go. They were masking images far before Photoshop and they showed in this video. An artist would come in with a knife and cut a mask for the image and swap out the sky. That's how they did this before computers, so they definitely had the ability to use layers. He even says at the end that after doing this photo touch-up process that no one would notice. But let's remember that for later. But yeah, if you guys don't know what a mask is, it's basically creating different elements or cutouts from different photographs so that you can use them later in layers. I can make a mask of a building, right? So I cut that building out and then I can put it in any situation I want. I can move it on top of another photograph and attempt to find a similar perspective and merge these different layers together to create a new altered photograph. The more talented the artist, the more realistic the result and the manipulation is hardly noticeable. But that's only because we were never taught about this subject in detail. If you think this is just a conspiracy, it's not, and I'm sure all of you are well aware of spirit photography. Yet, do they ever explain how they make these photos and the implications of this art form? The story of spirit photography actually starts with a James Wallace Black, and I've never known this in regards to spirit photography, but supposedly before this all went down, one morning in October of 1860, this J.W. Black goes up with one of the best aerialists Samuel Archer King and they went up in this balloon named the Queen of the Air. Now the reason I bring this up is because this J.W. Black Eye is responsible for creating the first aerial photographs in America in 1860. So they want you to believe that the daguerreotype came out in 1839, but then they waited 20 years to do aerial photography? I don't believe that at all. And what about all those aerial engravings from the early 1800s? Did they have anything to do with this? We'll get this. 
This JW black guy, which seems to be some type of propaganda, but it gets crazy because this aerial photography guy meets William Mumler, which is the famed originator of spirit photographs. Many who have looked into the subject of spirit photography will know Mumler very well. They claim in the history that when these two met in 1860, they had already been practicing photography for 20 years. But like I said, why wouldn't they just fly up in a balloon? The US military didn't have any aerial travel? That's what they tell us. Oh, but they had saddle balloons and fancy depictions of these crafts yet we are to believe it took until the late 1800s until aerial travel became more common. Supposedly, Black was a true believer in William Mumler's ability to capture images of spiritual beings, and I did not believe that for one moment. This J.W. Black had been in photography for over 20 years. He knew all the tricks of the trade. There's no way he just believed in Mumler. He was connected to this entire scam. They say Black believed him because when Black attempted to do this in his studio, he could not figure out Mumler's trick. And so he just trusted it to be true? It doesn't make that much sense because he would have been fully aware that before the glass negatives were used in 1859, that all spear photography was exposure based, proving that they had mastered the art of using exposure to manipulate photos. Then in 1859, according to Wiki, the glass negatives began to be used and this is what allowed for making double images. Now all of a sudden, Spirits began to regularly appear in these photographs. And the interesting thing is, is that many people believe these spirit photographs to be true till this day because many of us do not understand the processes that were used to make these photos. So Wiki says 1859, these glass negatives came out and they could make double images. Well, that's not necessarily true because in 1857, one of the earliest composited photographs that they'll tell us is called The Two Ways of Life from 1857 by Oscar Gustav Rylander. And we'll come back to Mumler and spirit photography in a minute, but I wanted to make sure that you thoroughly understand what we're talking about when we say early Photoshop. Like I said, there really isn't that much information on this, to the point where people don't even know the correct terminology. These early composites have a name. They are called Victorian photo montages. If you look up photo montage, it will tell you about the two ways of life. I actually learned about this in compositing class at school, but if you go look at the page, they won't tell you how many negatives were used in two ways of life on the wiki. And it wasn't just a double image. Two ways of life used over 30 glass negatives combined to make this epic photo montage or what we now called a composite image, Photoshop. This is a very interesting history because it's not well known, and this is 1857. This is before spirit photography. It's also the most controversial photograph, but they never really explain why. On the wiki for photo montage, they'll show you a few examples with pictures, the ones that people probably have heard of, but they're not going to give you a full breakdown. Most art historians know of these famous composites, but it actually continues in the text explaining that these photo montages were used in Montreal to commemorate large social events that could not otherwise be captured. Okay, so faking photos. And then they would create fake postcards, just like we learned earlier. But not just for memories, for propaganda as well, as during World War I, photographers from Europe began producing massive amounts of postcards showing soldiers on one plane and lovers, wives, and children in another plane. It also continues to say that these early photo montages would consist of photographic elements. And listen carefully. Superimposed watercolors, or in other words, paint. So Wiki's telling you that they would combine multiple photos to create composites and they would paint on them as well. Interesting. This continues on throughout the early 20th century. The name photo montage didn't really come until 1916 and I think this is a cover name because it gives the impression that it was just a cut and paste kind of like a collage or something but no this was more accurately called photo processing or photo manipulation which would involve not only correction but they would integrate multiple negatives of other photographs 
in order to tell the story that they wish. They were using these throughout World War I supposedly. They want you to believe that it wasn't until 1920 with Hartfield that they began using these to tell a story, or in other words, propaganda. They were using photo montages, over 240 during the Nazi period to use as a weapon against fascism in the Third Reich. But like I said, they want you to think that photo montages are like Hannah Hill's work, some kind of creative collage, when the truth is, these are just the obvious ones. What about the ones that were not so obvious? This was used in Russian propaganda as well, with artists such as Eli Lasitsky, Alexander Rodchenko, and Gustav Klutzis, and Valentina Kulingina. Seems to me that they had this process fully mastered by the 1920s for the use of propaganda. But what about before? For example, did you know that one of the most famous paintings of Lincoln is actually a composite which places Abe's head on the southern politician John Calhoun's body? This process of photo manipulation dates back to the 1850s and it was used to trick people just like we use Photoshop today. And they could do this by adding negatives in a wet collodion process which would allow them to extract and mix multiple negatives together for a final image. This photograph is titled General Grant at City Point. This is a montage or a composite of several images and does not actually show General Ulysses S. Grant at City Point. Three photos provided different parts of the portrait, the head from Grant at his Cold Harbor, Virginia headquarters, the horse and the man's body from Major General Alexander McDowell McCook, and the background from Confederate prisoners captured in the Battle of Fisher's Hill, Virginia. This photograph is dated 1902. We were told that the camera never lies, right? Well, it turns out that studios have been doing photo montages since the 1850s, possibly earlier, and it could combine up to 30 different negatives. Here's a great example that's not very well known. In 1871, Ernest Eugene Appert faked photographs of the 1871 Paris Commune massacres. Well, it turns out that he was a French photographer known for having produced a series of faked photos titled Crimes de la Commune, meant to discredit the communards protesting in the Paris communes of 1871. He actually has many works, so we know that one's faked, but what about his other photos? Wig doesn't really say anything about them, but look at these. Some of these are more obvious than others, but you can see how amazing this art form was in 1870. They could create entire scenes to tell whatever story they wanted to tell. Massacres? Large crowd gatherings? This is pretty insane when you think about the implications of 1870 propaganda having composited or photo montages, photoshop, I mean, how can we trust anything that these elite figures give to us? Well, there's more. But one of Stalin's most famous photographs is actually a fake photograph. It's called the Commissar Vanishes, in which we can see that there is an officer to the right of the photo that they took out using old world photo manipulation. This is in 1920s, so no computers at all, yet they had mastered the ability to completely remove people from photos? Well, Stalin used a large group of photo retouchers to cut his enemies out of supposedly documentary photographs." End quote. So are there many more of these photos? They never really talk about this process either, right? Like you'll see them talking about this photo on the History Channel, but they won't go into the history of old world photo manipulation and what other photos could possibly be faked. They just want to cover this so that you think that the bad guys or the fascists were the ones using this stuff for propaganda, right? But as most of you know, who do you think was funding World War I? That's a long story, but yeah, they definitely had mastered this ability by the 1920s. Quote, it's thought that Stalin's obsession with photo doctoring consisted a mini industry in the USSR. Publishers were contacted by Stalin's minions and told to eliminate the enemy du jour from upcoming photos and they did. According to design historian David King, who uncovered thousands of doctored photos in their original versions, 
the work was not performed in one location or even through an official ministry. End quote. So the question is, did this industry exist before the Soviet Union? Also, in 1937, there's a photo of Hitler and one of his original allies that then turned enemies was taken out, but I thought it was a great example of how they had a clone tool or the ability to in-paint and remove objects and then insert the appropriate background. That's some pretty advanced editing, especially with the grass and trees. But let's continue with Mummler and then let's look at some more examples of early Victorian composites or photo montages. Well, now we can see that this whole story that J.W. Black truly believed in Mummler is complete BS. They just say that to give more credit to this entire story of spirit photography because the idea is that other photographers, other historic photographers couldn't even figure out his method. But J.W. Black would have been fully aware of the advancements of the art with the release of these glass negatives as there were several artists during these times using these advanced workflows. He must have considered it as a possible solution to the Mumler mystery, but the story goes, he sends his assistant over Horace Weston to Mumler's studio, which was conveniently just a few blocks down from Black's studio, and that his assistant was to go to Mumler's studio and take notes, but do not say that he was Black's assistant. So this Weston guy goes over to Mumler's studio to take the photo, and it comes out to have his deceased father in the photo. So Weston, who is Black's assistant, but also, Black claims to have been taught photography the best, and that if anything was amiss, Weston would know. So after Mumler took this photograph and Weston saw his deceased father, he said, quote, All I can say to Mr. Black, he said to Mumler, admitting that he had been sent there on a mission, quote, is that I have not seen anything different from taking an ordinary picture. Now, this is ridiculous because the process is not done when the photo is taken, it's done in the dark room and the news promoting this stuff knows that most people do not know that. So people automatically assume that this was some type of practical effect, when it's not. It's pretty simple actually, it's just multiple negatives combined. Which I'm not saying it's not possible to do some type of thoughtography experiment, but these early spirit photographs are blatant fakes. And we know that this is connected with the photographer who took the first aerial shots of cities in America. Then there's this whole story how Black came back to Mumler after this and was like, okay, I want to see the whole process. And that he watched Mumler actually prepare the negative and bring it into the darkroom. So Black doesn't notice anything suspicious, but weirdly, Black was supposed to be a skeptic. Then out of nowhere, Black is like, you know what? I want you to go ahead and finish this process yourself. You go develop the negative. I'm not acquainted with working with your chemicals and I might ruin it. So Black just leaves him alone. And then he adds towards the end that, quote, you're not smart enough to put anything on that negative without my detecting it, end quote. Then Mumler said, I am well aware of that. So Mumler pours his chemicals on the plate, and then I guess after doing this secret process, he hands the negative to Black as he watches the photo develop with a man that appeared leaning on his shoulder. Black was so amazed and said, is it possible? Well, what I think is two things. Either one, Black was in on this whole process and they were developing a scam that was going to make them millions, right? They're selling photos of supposed real dead relatives. Think about how much people would pay for that. Now the other option is this Mumler character developed some secret technique for merging negatives unknown to other photographers at the time. Possibly some chemical method in which he would temporarily bring another negative he had and project that photo onto another plate using chemicals, kind of like an old tracing device. This would then leave no evidence on the plate and future generations would have no idea how the photo was made. There's actually a video where they try to replicate it, but no one knows Mumler's secret process. Just think about that. Mumler was one of the greatest hoaxes of the 19th century, and it worked. People believed in this because it was such a new technology. Well, that's what the mainstream historians will say. They most likely had this tech earlier, but my point is, orphans who are given photographs 
who have no understanding of compositing, advanced photo processing workflows, combining negatives, and many other techniques are not going to question a photograph that looks genuinely real, especially when there's a story that goes with it. Now with spirit photography, that's pretty obvious. And most of you would agree that not only is it an example of old world photo manipulation, but an old world lie, a hoax. But how deep does this go? So to recap, when it comes to photo montages, in art history, they really only teach it from the standpoints of hoaxes, propaganda, then it being picked up by the surrealist and contemporary artist. They may mention a few famous early composites as the two ways of life, but they don't really talk about other figures like Gustave Le Grey, which is the origin of the sky swap. I'm sure many of you are very familiar with the vanilla skies phenomenon as this can be clearly seen in many old photographs. And there are even skeptics who say that the explanation of this is simply due to the nature of the visible light spectrum, that reds will come out darker and blues would show up as brighter. This is actually true, which really leads people to thinking that, oh, well I guess that's it. I guess old photographs were just overexposed and had vanilla skies because that's just the nature of the emulsions used, but Two things can be true at the same time. Meaning, this is an issue, right? This is a problem of vanilla skies. It's interesting because this whole argument that blues were overexposed actually proves without a doubt that they were using photo manipulation from the start to deal with this issue. It starts with Gustave Le Grey, who was the pioneer of what's called the collodion process invented by Frederick Scott Archer, which was an early photo manipulation pre-processed technique in which the photographic material would be coated, sensitized, and exposed, then developed within a span of 15 minutes. The collodion process is what allowed Le Grey to solve the problem of vanilla skies that could not be solved with the supposed new technology at the time, the problem of the blank sky. Now some of you may think this is proof against vanilla skies, but it is actually the opposite. You see, because in 1850, they were using this problem of photography for their advantage. They were dedicated to solving it, and strangely, this whole collodion process in Le Grey is connected with the French government at the time, where in Mission Heliographique, the ramparts of Carcassonne, 1851, shows that Le Grey was actually going around and taking pictures of ancient sites and castles in France and that he was dedicated to taking one of these photos of the castle and doing a photo sky swap for the bleached area of the sky, meaning they wanted to manipulate a photograph of an ancient site done during a survey of multiple different locations. Well, in an 1850 study of light and dark, they were trying to solve this problem of creating skies and taking pictures of the sea since they were both blue. So back in the 1850s, they had adjusted the exposure and chemicals used to be able to capture the blue spectrum. And on top of this, he put them together to create an artwork titled Solar Effects, which, have you told someone this was an old photograph? No one would guess it's edited. Quote, there seems to be no extent statements by Le Grey on how he was inspired to use the revolutionary method of combination printing with multiple negatives, nor are there any instructions from him as to how he printed out the final image. Hmm. Is it possible that, aware of the competition among art photographers, he was prudently silent? Hmm, so they were keeping the secret. Whatever his procedures, Le Grey's seascapes which combined separate shots of the sky and sea in one stunning image were considered a major if not astonishing development in his own time." End quote. So there you go. This is a secret process. Back in the 1850s, they were already solving a solution for these bleached skies. And they had realistic photo compositing or what they call Victorian photo montages. With this process, they began capturing stock photos of multiple skies and seas throughout the French coast. So this proves that they were able to capture blue light over 250 years ago. Here in 1858, 
we have an early composite called Faded Away by Henry Peach Robinson, which was constructed by five different negatives. I would say this is quite advanced for such an early time period. There are also several photos that had unknown artists, and they'll show some of these when typing in old Photoshop, but just kind of strange that nobody knows who took these photos. The Double-Headed Man from 1865. A man juggling his own head from 1880. A man on a rooftop with 11 men in formation on his shoulders. And this one really makes you think. It's kind of funny because I remembered when I was a kid, my mom put up this photograph in our bathroom. It's a really famous photograph. Lunch atop a skyscraper, 1932. But now that we've learned more about early photographic techniques, who is to say that this has not been altered? Yet nowhere do they say whether or not they used multiple negatives in this photograph. Well, it's mostly attributed to Lewis Hine, but the identity of the photographer remains unknown. This is literally referenced as being a piece of American history, but they don't know who the photographer is. Notice the faint glow or halo around the people. Is this a photo montage? Think about it. They started figuring out that they could produce legendary, amazing photographs and then claim that they're real. Think of the implications. You don't think Robert Barians, wealthy capitalists, and these elite politicians were aware of this? I think they were well aware of it. So much so that it was an entire industry. Now before we continue, let's have an understanding of the different types of photo processing, which each one is unique and yields different results. Photography is simply a chemical technology. You have a plate that can be a variety of different materials, older ones were metal or tin, and then came the glass. These plates are coated with chemicals that then react with light. Using different chemicals and different plate materials would produce a variety of different effects. Here are some photographic processes that have been essentially forgotten. The heliograph, the helotype, Kali type, Biz autotype, Kalotype, Cyanotype, Daguerreotype, Aerotype, Ambrotype, Carbon print, Albumin print, and Carta de Vista, but there are many more and others that were kept secret as they had this technology to assist engravings with copper plates. Now most of you know about tin types because they have these at the fair. They are thought of as being much quicker than the other types and so not much is needed to be done in the studio, but many of these were actually altered to create composite photographs. Tin types and amber types use this early wet collodion process in order to capture an underexposed image that they would then treat with chemicals to be treated as a positive instead. So this negative treated as a positive would be put in front of black paper to create amber types. And then for tin types and ferrotypes, it would be a black lacquered metal. So they don't say this is a manipulated image, but the sky is very clear and in this tin type, it's from circa 1900. They also had what was called a photographic fixer in which they used potassium cyanide to obtain as light toned an image as possible. This was a way to fix overexposed images as well to make them more stable and prevent fogging. Tin types were actually first called melanotypes. Crayon and chalk portraits were artistically manipulated images that appear to be a cross between chalk or crayon drawings. Japanese photographs in the 1860s all went through a tinting process. Many of these are extreme quality, but what it shows is how much processing went into making a photograph, even to the point of them being a staged artwork. The process of doctoring photographs has existed since the dawn of photography, yet are we not going to discuss the ethics involved with such a powerful tool of propaganda? Remember, these early photos are historic records in many instances. We do know that they had retouching studios that would go through the process of de-aging, similar to modern day social media filters. They could do this before the 1900s and they could clean or remove anything that they wanted. I think that's the base concept for vanilla skies. That these photos show signs of early tampering. 
and it doesn't really matter that there were some photographic processes that overexposed the whites because, as we learned, they had other processes to accommodate for this. Hence, they knew this was a problem and that it could be used to hide certain features. I'll explain more on that soon. But early photographs, about all of them, would go through a photo touch-up process. There's old books that explain this clearly. Listen to this. From the 1905 Illinois College of Photography, we have a small book speaking and explaining photography and how it depends on retouching. Quote, photography, what it is, and how it is done. For the benefit of those who are not familiar with the art and science of photography, some explanation is necessary. When a picture is taken with a camera, it is made upon a glass plate, which after development, shows the object in shades of black and white inversely. This plate is called a negative, in which all little imperfections of the skin, together with the shadows, wrinkles, and facial blemishes are necessarily exaggerated and must be overcome by hand work in order to produce a correct and pleasing picture. It is to improve the picture by removing and softening these blemishes that the plate is sent to the retoucher, who works upon the negative itself with fine implements." End quote. So, they had this art mastered. Entire colleges dedicated to this profession. Let me show you some examples of what they could do. Well, I think most of you have heard about the de-aging, but they had a process that was called etching, that an artistic photographer could come in and manipulate the negative. It's interesting because you can't find detailed explanations online on what this is. We know that they would retouch photographs with paints and even airbrushing, which is a term they still use today, but they were doing this since the beginning of photography. Airbrush can actually be more difficult to notice, but they don't really talk about this early photographic process too much. It's called etching and modeling. And in a book from 1909, which is actually based on an older book from 1868, we are given many examples and explanations as to what this process entails. Quote, etching is exactly the reverse of retouching, for by means of the etching knife, which is a very sharp steel blade, the film is shaved or scraped in proportion to the amount required to be removed. Thus highlights are reduced, shadows accentuated, objectionable portions removed, and detail produced where the opacity of the negative was so strong as to destroy it. Now, that's still not really explaining it, so they were scraping the negative with a knife to remove things? Okay. And they were messing with the lights and shadows, and to remove or soften over detailed areas. Yeah, but not only could they remove blemishes and make people look younger, they were capable of warping and manipulating necks to be skinnier. So this is etching? Here is an illustration in which they detail this etching process where they straighten crossed eyes, which is pretty impressive for this time period. So they could take a picture of you with your eyes closed and then somehow etch an eye in, which looks to have started from a drawing and then they mixed in other negatives, then finally cleaning it up with the etching process to make it look real. If you were only looking at the final version, you would never know that this photo had been manipulated so they could also change people's size. And then they could add clothes onto a subject that would end with a realistic result. They could fix hairstyles, change your body into drastic proportions. Then they explain how to etch single figures to remove figures from groups, okay? This is 10 years before Stalin and it's based on an older book. So, they could have been doing this stuff far earlier. Okay, listen carefully to this. Quote, By the combination of etching and retouching, by the use of the knife and pencil, you etch and model. And with these two instruments, you can make any alteration you desire on the negative. Highlights on the bones and cheek may be cut down and subdued. Thick necks made thin. Excessive drapery removed. Crooked noses straightened. Shadows accentuated, hair added, backgrounds altered, objectionable portions removed, figures taken from groups, etc. 
So basically, anything they wanted to do. This is old world Photoshop. They did this with landscape paintings, postcards, portraits, family photos. Why are we not to believe that they did this with political photos and our historical record? People believe that buildings are built at specific dates solely off this historical record which could have been easily manipulated. Who left these photos behind? Who owns the newspaper companies? Who owns the colleges? They had this art form mastered and it most likely is ancient in origin. One exercise in the book shows how students would attempt to etch in different values and to produce soft gradual fades with a knife in order to have fine control over this process. The author then explains how to remove the figure from the background to make it much more pleasing than the original and then also the process in adjusting the shadows to be a softer value. Basically, all old world photos are fake. This is the process of photography. Negatives would be etched and modeled in order to look good. They had to, otherwise the details were too strong and there were many dark areas, so our photographic record of retouched photos are manipulated photos, altered photos, doctored photos, old world photoshop, whatever you want to call it, but they aren't real. And we should certainly be questioning any photos on the historical record and the level of retouching that has been done to these. Obviously, there's levels to this. Photographs require the process and sometimes, sure, there's only minimal alteration. But this process was known by the politicians and robber barons at the time. You don't think they would take advantage of this? There's a section in the book where he speaks of etching statuettes. And this is really strange. Quote, Departing from regular commercial retouching work, it is possible to produce some very pleasing and artistic effects which are always appreciated by the picture-loving public. For special work, and particularly along advertising lines, the retoucher will be called upon to work up negatives and prints, securing effects differing vitally from the original. The clever use of the etcher and pencil will enable the photographer to produce almost any desired results along these lines." End quote. He explains how the entire figure is masked and separated, put on a new background, and then they would blend the head of a child over the body poses, meaning he's explaining how they could seamlessly blend multiple photos in a realistic way. Not just sky swapping, because that could be a hard mask. He's explaining the process in which they would take a picture of a body pose and head pose separately to get a desired effect that when they mixed it and seamlessly blent the photo, it gave the desired vision to the client. Hmm, so isn't that interesting? They have an advanced etching that shows how they could turn someone's portrait into a statue. They could even change your facial expression if they needed. Now, although this book does describe in detail this process, they really only focus on human subjects, like portraits and retouching, but that doesn't mean that's all that this etching can do. Now that we understand the photo manipulation process, it's not only in portraits, because you'll see this whole 1900s Photoshop on news sites, right? They've made these articles on the subject, but they're only gonna show you retouched portraits. Yet, could they do this with landscapes? Architectural photos? Construction photos? Political events? It seems that there should be more historical information on this subject, especially if we find these photos in historical archives. Here's Colorado Springs from 1913. That shows how this process would be done in a more obvious fashion. But let's see if there are some instances that are less noticeable. But I want you to remember who printed these in thousands of other photographs and postcards. The Detroit Publishing Company. Shout out to Biggs. Please go give him a follow guys, he was nice enough to help with the video and provide a great collection to start from. Links are in the description so that you can even download it yourself. In the Library of Congress archives, if we look at this circa 1900 picture of the Murray Hill Hotel in New York. Now, I'm just going to leave it zoomed out for a second. At first glance, there's nothing too suspicious. I mean, that is a strange fog over the top of the building, it doesn't really look like natural exposure. and. You can also see that the sky is visible. 
So how can that be so? Is this a sky swapped image? Well, let's zoom in closer because this photo is very weird. Well, for starters, the entire bottom and right side of this image is painted. Yet we know that the beast is a photograph. Look at this, it's just really strange because this is labeled as a dry plate negative. It's not mentioned as a photo montage or doctored image, but why not? 15% of this image was painted in to look realistic, to be invisible, the true art of retouching. In the sky, there's paint on the clouds, and you can even see etching marks left over from this process. You can see that the streets were painted over. This car was painted over for some reason. The street light is completely painted in. And don't say, oh, it's because some things just didn't come into detail. No, this is another level of paint over. There are random people painted in in a variety of different places, some poorly drawn, but from a distance, you would never notice. Painted over faces in random areas. This entire portion of the stairs is painted in. So they would paint on historic photos? Not just paint, but to make it realistic from a distance. It's weird because to the right of this image, there's a section that's not painted. And you can see it looks like a building, so were they trying to paint that out? In Australia, there's a collection of photographs known as the Tarot Collection in the Powerhouse Museum. They never say anything about altered photographs or manipulation. But in this photo, called Carrying Wool, and it's in Sydney, well, we see what looks like at the top grey paint with white writing and an overexposed white sky. This isn't just overexposure of light due to the blues picking up brighter, but instead, it is a clear cutout. Now at first, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but let's look up closer. You can see that they massed around these men and behind them is the original sky color and exposure. And as you get over to the wool, you can actually see that they cut up to 15 men out of the photo. You can see their legs once you zoom in. Truth is, many of these photos have unknown artists and no one knows the reason why they would even do this. In the Library of Congress, there's a photo of Narragansett Pier, Rhode Island, and it seems that this is very similar. The gray is the original sky, but for some reason, they're coming in and adding in white? There's no explanation in the description other than these are dry plate negatives. You can see this in multiple photos of this collection. From the Library of Congress, Shelton Square, Buffalo. Let's take a look at this from a glance. What do you think? If this was framed in a museum, I wouldn't really notice anything. But let's look closer. The first and most obvious alteration is that the image has been painted on. Streets were completely painted over. Figures and people drawn in. Now some may say, oh well, they're just cleaning up exposure ghosting. But it's actually more than that. You can even see that they had an understanding on how to paint shadows. Remember what we learned from the photography self manual. This was an artistic process with handling these negatives and with a knife they could alter and manipulate the image to fit the vision. I say that because if I was to tell you that these people could be added in without stating anything that we said before, most people would be like you are crazy. But why? This person is looking straight at the ground. This guy has his hands behind his back. They had the science and art down to combine photos and add shadows in. More people equals a more pleasing photograph. If they had hundreds of stock photos of skies, who's to say that they don't have the same for all sorts of categories, including people standing and looking at nothing, then using the etching process or even paint to just finalize the photo most people would not be able to notice because they have no clue of the process in general as the guy in the Vox video says, who's going to grab a magnifying glass and look at these things? You could even combine negatives of badly taken photographs to give the impression of bad exposure, which would explain why sometimes in these old photographs you see a combination of very sharp people and then very blurry people and some of them are not moving, it's not just because of the speed, it seems that they may have been combining multiple negatives with different resolutions. They even painted over this horse, and even some of the perspectives of these carts look off. 
There are actually multiple versions of this photo in this collection where you can see in this V2 version that there's a white scratch off section with this big white rectangle. And sure, maybe this is just an artifact of something touching the negative, but then what is all this scratching on this middle building? We can also see the same thing in this V3 version where the building with the white bandaid now has similar scratchings to the middle building from V2 as if they were trying to take it out to use for other photos. Possibly some chemical solution was added to these sections in order to extract certain features. From the Library of Congress, the Soldiers Monument in Troy, New York, this looks to be a pretty normal historical photograph. But it's actually an example of a photo that has been vanilla skied. Nothing seems wrong from a distance, right? If you zoom in on the far left of the photo here, it's blatantly clear that a mask of some kind was made around the top of the building. And if you look right here at this splatter, you can see that some sections didn't get picked up, showing that there's still parts of the building. And you can see that this is confirmed because there's a street lamp behind this car on the left, right? Just follow that and you will see those wires. What are those? Now you can see there are wires going into the trees, wires down this poles, and going up into this area that was painted over or removed chemically. Follow the line even more, and then there's this corner section of the roof, which is clearly a higher section of the building that was cut to look like just some side brick panel to the roofing. But that's a cutout, and there was a building there, which is strange because that doesn't seem to line up with the building that's now there to the left. Notice that ornamental border on the top? So is this an added building? Or not even just a separate negative? Notice how it's a different quality and sharpness. It has a different mid-level to me. I mean, why are we not to believe that this entire image is a composite? They could have easily added these people to the foreground to make it look more alive and full. There's also these cracks on the obelisk that look added or scratched in as if they were trying to get rid of something. To me, it looks like they were hiding wires that were high in the sky, even cutting off this pole. And this goes all the way to the other side of the photo. It's not just exposure. But why do this and leave no explanation? We got a couple more from the Library of Congress, the Wayne County and Home Savings Bank, Detroit, Michigan. Now this image looks fine to me. I think most people would just think, oh, that's a historic photo. Well, on closer inspection, the sky is just paint, so it's a fake sky. There are electrical cables that were painted out, and some sections here are just floating. To the right of the image, we see several men with top hats, and some of the pants have been painted on in a very strange fashion. Also, this car right here to the right was painted over, and this guy doesn't even have a face. Some of you may think, well, oh, you're just overanalyzing this stuff. They just wanted to clean up the photos to make it look nicer. Okay. Well, you see this white line right here? Let's follow that line and it leads to the building. We're going up, up, and look how this is following the outline of this building. What you're looking at are the remnants of a hard mask. You can even see that they painted over at the top. It's a copy and paste building, and you have to admit, if I didn't zoom in that, most people would not have noticed. There's also another indication, is that you will see a faint white glow effect around cutouts. They're barely noticeable, but now that you can clearly see that it's a cut and a combination of multiple negatives, they don't even describe that in the description. Well, they don't even know the date. Once you see it, it's very easy to spot in other photographs. And another building from Detroit, the Wayne County building from circa 1902, the image has been vanilla skied. It's obvious towards the right because they didn't even finish it, but you may think that, oh well, that's just an accident. Well, there's a moon tower to the right of this building. You couldn't even notice it from a distance. Very strange, they removed it. And towards the top, they removed it entirely. You can barely see it. But it's there, next to this horrible masking job. They didn't even care because they knew people wouldn't notice. 
These moon towers were electrical towers providing light to the city. For some reason, they wanted to remove all traces of the moon towers and cables connected to them in these historic images and just left us with many that have this vanilla skies phenomena. If you look at the front of the photo, you can see how many cables were really there. And also, many of these Detroit moon towers were purchased by Austin, and some still stand supposedly. But yeah, someone separated this building from the background and removed major portions of this entire image, including the trolley lines and the buildings on the left and right. Now, all of these photos that I showed you from the Library of Congress are from the Detroit Publishing Company. Remember that Colorado picture? that was an obvious composite? So, the Detroit Publishing Company had full knowledge of how to mask and composite images for Victorian photo montages. The Vanilla Skies is not just an overexposure, but a masking process in which these photo publishing companies would combine and alter photographs. The Detroit Publishing Company were known for making famous postcards. Remember the same skies? Well, Nowhere on this wiki page does it explain any techniques used or any manipulation or retouching done with their postcards. It also doesn't say that they donated their collection to the Library of Congress. So, many of the photos in their collection are considered historic dry plates. If they were altering postcards, why couldn't they alter all the other photos they took? Speaking of, their most famous photographer was William Henry Jackson. Now this guy is a historical figure. Not just that, but he became the manager of the Detroit Publishing Company in 1903. Well, this guy is famous for his photos of the American West and is the great, great nephew of Samuel Wilson or Uncle Sam. Uncle Sam is a national personification of the federal government and the character came to be during the War of 1812. Everyone knows this propaganda piece. Well. Uncle Sam's nephew, William Henry Jackson, and his grandfather also did comics for the newspaper, so this is within their whole family history. William Henry Jackson was a Civil War painter, and his mother, Harriet Maria Allen, was a talented watercolorist. Jackson was considered an excellent young painter. William is considered important to the history of the Old West because he would hike his way through the Oregon Trail and go to the most remote locations to take these photographs. He was with the Mormons and made his way to Salt Lake City, then took a wagon all the way to Los Angeles, taking some of the most important historical photos in the west of the United States. Supposedly, he took 80,000 photographs of the American West, and then he was memorialized by the Adventures Club of New York which was an adventure-oriented private men's club founded in New York in 1912 by Arthur Hoffman, who was the creator of the pulp magazine Adventure, in which he used to promote his political views and get people ready for war. He was basically a journalist his entire life, so propaganda? What is the purpose of this adventure club? Mark Twain was also a member, strangely. So these guys were all in cahoots. And when Jackson was in southwestern Colorado, he discovered this area where the Hoven Wheat National Monument is, where he is responsible for its name. So Hoven Wheat means deserted valley, but it also means ruins of the ancient communities. Here is William Henry with a massive camera and the description says, unidentified equipment. Well. Let's take a look at some of the photographs that they claim William Henry took in his career, because he took photos all around the world. Here is a church in Guadalupe, Mexico. Just overexposed blues? Nope. Vanilla sky. Look here in the corner. The trees are cut off. They didn't even finish the process. There are actually many of these photos that they just credit to William Henry Jackson. One of these descriptions says probably William Henry Jackson. So, is he just another figure like Uncle Sam? A cultural icon for these corporations to feed us so we don't ever question what's going on? Like this 1870 photo by Jackson of a guy hiking with a suit. This seems weird. He is responsible for Mexico in color and many photographs with vanilla skies. This cathedral. A train bridge 
which what seems to be on top of an ancient dam with arched tunnels. It's also signed Detroit Photographic. There's an entire World's Transportation Commission with 900 images by William Henry Jackson throughout North Africa, Asia, Australia, and I'm not saying this is impossible, but think if this really was a production company. Like, people don't get the same value unless they think an artist or a public figure is behind it, so it seems more natural, but when a huge corporation is involved, people would start asking questions. There are some more photos from other studios, such as the collection of Fifth Avenue from start to finish. There's a photo where at the bottom right, there's a police officer that's just painted in and the streets are painted on top of a photograph. And this is a New York Public Library archives. And another, a horse is painted in. With some of these older photographs in this collection, it's hard to see the masking around the buildings because the quality is really bad. Many times, some of these earlier photographs from the 1880s don't have enough resolution, and so it's much more difficult to be able to see signs of sky swapping or even cuts around the buildings. Look at this photo. It seems like any other historical photo. But if you zoom in, you can see this guy standing here strangely, and then there's someone walking behind this car, yet you can see the person's outline through the car? This can't be a product of exposure. It must be an artifact from the use of multiple negatives. I could continue to do this for many of these photos. They have crowds, painted buildings. There's no constraint with what they can do. If something's missing, they will just use etching to alter the photograph, combine negatives to achieve a final result, and then donate it to the Library of Congress and many local museums. And this is what they show in many cases. This is our photographic record? It's from the same people who produced all these postcards? Think about it. There needs to be full-on explanations on how these photos were made, especially historical photos. How can we trust construction photos as solid proof when we know they had Photoshop in the 1850s and they were using this process of photo manipulation during World War I for propaganda? How can we trust anything that the official mainstream narrative gives us are we supposed to just accept that they built thousands of these buildings starting in the 1880s to the early 1900s? Where did they get all this money? We couldn't do that today. Even with all our equipment and money, we could not build thousands of these brick structures in a 20 year time period. Some histories even give us less time for these construction dates. And the only proofs we are given are photographs, many of which are extremely questionable. The extreme lack of photographic records itself is suspicious. Now add on that they had mastered the ability to manipulate photos in the early 1800s? We have a recipe for completely controlling the narrative of future generations. This would be the most powerful tool of the elite. So, we must use other methods to question the official narrative outside of photographs that were given to the libraries and archive collections through these corporate publishing companies and who do you think owned and funded these companies? Boy clubs. So what do you think? Should we trust historical photos without any question? Or should we be more observant when being handed a story from officials? To check for manipulation and lies so that we can really get to the bottom of what's going on. I hope you guys enjoyed that. If you have any more knowledge on early composited photographs or examples, please let us know and check out the Discord. With that, let's keep questioning the mainstream narrative and may our minds be unveiled. Let go of everything you think to be true. Relax the mind and ask the question, do I truly understand what this reality is?